Um, good good uh, morning, uh, participants. Um, thank you for joining our webinar uh, this early morning. Uh, I'll request all our panelists to mute, mute themselves as, as we make the introduction. Uh, so to all our honorable members of PSK, our guests from other cadres, um, to our distinguished panelists, um, I would like to welcome you to this webinar. My name is uh, Dr. Daniela Munene and I'm the CEO of Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. I'll be your host this morning and I'm really excited to, to hear, I'm looking forward to hear about field epidemiology um, uh, and pharmacists' um, contribution to that for COVID-19. And so right away, I'd like to introduce you to our moderators for the day. And our first moderator is Dr. Michael Mungoma. He's a member of PSK, and he's also the Dean School of Pharmacy at Mount Kenya University. He's also a member of the PSK um, National Executive Committee of the National Governing Council, and he's a member of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Uh, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Mike Mungoma. Thank you. Our second moderator is Dr. Sylvia Opanga. <clears throat> She's uh, a member of PSK. She's also a senior lecturer at the School of Pharmacy, University of Nairobi. She's also the chair of the Education and Public Health Committee of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Um, and she's a champion of clinical care, I might add. Karibu sana, Dr. Sylvia Opanga. Thank you, Dr. Daniela. All right, over to you, uh, panelists. Please uh, take us through the program. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Michael Mungoma. Thank you once again for joining us this morning for this webinar as we continue sharing experiences in the pharmaceutical sector. So again, welcome to everyone uh, of uh, the various cadres. A few ground rules before we start. One, participants are all muted during the entire course of the webinar. Please ask questions through the Q&A tab that is at the bottom of your window. And I would encourage those that have questions really to raise their questions during the webinar and not wait until the end. Questions will be addressed by panelists later in the, in the, in the program. For PSK members, those that have, haven't already done, uh, please subscribe to the PPB portal for today's webinar so that you can get your CPD points. Those from other cadres, please subscribe through your channels so that you can also get your CPD points. Note that CPDs will only be awarded to paid up members of PSK and that this webinar is also being recorded and the audio will be made available on the PSK's YouTube page. I want to introduce our speaker for today. He's called Dr. Frederick Ouma Othiambo. Dr. Ouma is a field epidemiologist and lab training program resident attached to the Division of National Malaria Program. He's a pharmacist. He is certified in logistics, commodity and supply chain management. He's also certified in clinical management of HIV from the University of Washington, as well as infection prevention and control. He's also certified in human subjects research from the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Diambo has worked as a pharmacist at the Jaramogi Oginga Odinga Teaching and Referral Hospital and the Kisumu County Hospital. His most recent position was Ministry of Health Pharmacist of the Kisumu Central Sub-County. Currently, he's responsible for COVID-19 contact tracing, data management, capacity building of healthcare providers. Welcome, Dr. Fred Oma. And without much ado, I really want you to Oh, before I go ahead, let me just uh, give us our program. So we are going to have 
our speaker talk on COVID-19 response at the National Public Health Emergency Operations Center uh, from now until noon, according to our program. Thereafter, we are going to have a question and answer session, and this is going to be moderated by Dr. Silvio Panga. Welcome, Dr. Fred Omer, and take us to our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tari. Um, hello, all. Uh, it's indeed an honor to make this presentation. So um, allow me to just go straight to the point, because I'm sure we might have a lot of questions after this. Um, next. So um, like you've uh, already been told, I am a resident in the Kenya Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Training Program, uh, usually called FELTEP or FLTP. Uh, which was established in 2004 as a division within the Directorate of Public Health and the Ministry of Health. So it's a division just like there's a malaria division, NASCOP, TB program, all those are divisions within the, the Ministry of Health. So it was started as a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and CDC uh, uh, to address the need to have a skilled public health workforce that supports the surveillance systems, respond to public health emergencies, and use data for decision making. Uh, the key mandate of the program is to increase epidemiological capacity in Kenya, and it is an accredited um, a body by the Training Programs for Epidemiology and Public Health Interventions Network, uh, also called TEFNET, as one of the first two FETP programs to be accredited in Africa. Uh, next. Uh, the mission of um, FELTP is to build a sustainable network of skilled applied epidemiologists who can measurably improve public health services through training while in service, efficient and effective investigation and uh, response to public health emergencies, building of strong surveillance systems, and conducting operational research to improve public health in Kenya and beyond. And next. So there are various objectives for the program, and um, uh, most of them relate to public health matters. Uh, that includes strengthening public health capacity by developing a cadre of health professionals with advanced skills in applied epidemiology and laboratory management, contribute to research activities on priority public health problems to strengthen national and regional capacity to respond to public health emergencies, where regional in this case refers to county, to strengthen national surveillance systems, uh, to strengthen laboratory participation in surveillance and field investigations, and to improve communications and networking of public health practitioners in, um, and researchers. So more of this will become clearer as we'll be talking about exactly what uh, FELTEP has been doing in our COVID-19 outbreak. We'll be seeing the, how the objectives are playing out uh, next. So our key functions um, in the program will include uh, training. Um, usually the training involves uh, officers from the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries, like the two-year master's training in field epidemiology um, that is offered by Mo University. It involves uh, officers from these two. Um, currently, there are, are uh, 16 um, officers undergoing the training in the first year, and there are 20 officers undergoing the training in their second year. Uh, the 16 that are currently undergoing the training, of which I'm part of, um, majority are medical officers. We have four medical officers. We have uh, three lab officers. We have um, three um, veterinary officers. Then we also have a nutritionist, a nurse, two public health officers, and myself, a pharmacist. Uh, traditionally, many, uh, most of the other cadres have been involved in the felt training. Uh, the information I've got so far is that I could be the second one to be in this training. I don't know whether it has been an, a matter of uh, lack of interest from pharmacists or lack of awareness or the program has not been selecting pharmacists for one reason or the other. 
but that is the current situation. So apart from uh, training, um, uh, FELTEP also provides technical support to the national and county levels for investigation of public health emergencies, so we support surveillance and use of surveillance data, conducting operational research and providing epidemiological support in both communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, as I'm um, speaking right now, we are in an outbreak investigation in uh, Kitui County, where we are investigating the recent outbreak of Kalaza. There's been a little bit of delay. I believe we've had a bit over the news for some time now, but mostly the delay has been attributed to COVID-19. A lot of energies were focused on COVID-19 to the extent that kickstarting such an activity uh, delayed a little bit. So we also build the capacity of healthcare workers at the county and national level who are proficient in both basic and intermediate level epidemiology. Uh, this one refers to the two other kinds of training apart from the master's training that involves epidemiology. There's a basic level epidemiology, which is a three month training. Um, and there's an intermediate level one, which is a six month training. Both of them on epidemiology, usually aspects within the same uh, master's training, but now it's a bit more squeezed with the uh, limited time. And of course there's limited uh, field exposure and all that, but they're still uh, great trainings that would encourage those of us that are able to to uh, enroll in. And um, another function would be to coordinate public health leadership training. In a recent program that is just being started, I think it's beginning this year, it's called Improving Public Health Management for Action, uh, which is being done as a collaboration between CDC and uh, Kenyatta University which is the academic partner. And next. So um, basically, as you've had, the major uh, types of activities that we engage in include um, outbreak investigations, trainings and workshops, uh, scientific conferences, and uh, uh, mostly those ones. But also we are involved in um, data analysis, uh, the times that various divisions or uh, arms of the government would invite FELTEP to help them uh, make sense of the data that they have uh, so as to improve decision making based on the available data. So um, there are various events that create opportunity for the epidemiologists to share uh, their practice and skills as well as gathering current information on public health issues as we are already aware public health issues would include uh, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases as well as uh, unintentional injuries, things like accidents and any other matter that relates to um, health. Next. So what is the role of FELTEP in the current um, COVID-19 pandemic? We started our activities in February when it was anticipated that the disease was almost hitting the country. So the first team was sent to conduct an assessment of the points of entry. Those are the ports, airports and uh, the other ports of entry. We conduct an assessment on their preparedness for COVID-19. Then in March, um, we were attached to the Emergency Operations Center, EOC. Uh, that's the Public Health Emergency Operations Center, which is uh, under the division of disease surveillance and epidemic response. So there we went to support contact tracing, rapid response and data management activities. Um, in a short while, we'll see the organogram and we see where those where activities will fall. So uh, we've been based in those places, um, performing various duties, including um, responding to uh, uh, reported uh, cases and uh, a number of other activities as we'll see as we continue. So we've also been supporting and capacity building counties on COVID-19 response, contact tracing and data management. So far we've visited um, at least 20 counties. We started with Kilifi, Mombasa. We visited um, Kiambu, Migori, Machakos, um, Nairobi, Nakuru, Kuala, Siaya. And I believe those of us from the counties have probably heard of our teams going there to help capacity build the county and sub-county teams on um, 
the, those uh, three major aspects of COVID-19 response. That is a rapid response, contact tracing, and data management. Next. So that is the um, Public Health Emergency Operations Center, COVID-19 incident management structure. Um, those of us that are familiar with this management uh, system, uh, this is an organized system that is used to um, carry out operations and ensure that the response to a public health issue is handled in a systematic and organized manner. The incident manager is one Dr. Kadondi Kasera, who is also the head of the emergency operations center. Um, so you can see the various uh, uh, sections within the uh, incident management structure. Um, under operations, you can see we have a national rapid response team. Uh, we also have the contact tracing team. Then under planning, we have the data management team. So our three main areas of operation have been national uh, rapid response team, RRT, contact tracing, and data management. That's where most of us have been involved in. But I must also mention that uh, you can see various uh, names attached to those positions. Uh, seven out of those 15 persons that have been named there have been through the FELTE program, uh, starting with the incident manager, who uh, is an alumni of FELTE. Uh, Dr. Nzioka, the information manager and safety officer, is also an alumni of FELTE. So basically, uh, this just helps to underline the role that field epidemiology and laboratory training program has in case of an outbreak like this. Um, seven out of those 15 officers have been through felt. Um, and uh, I must also mention that one of us, Dr. Hita Njuguna, I believe we know her, is also part of this, uh, this management structure as the supply chain manager. Uh, next. So, Rapid response. Um, what is rapid response? Basically, when we started the outbreak activities after just the first few cases were uh, announced, uh, rapid response was about responding to alerts that were being raised. So, in the initial parts of the, uh, the uh, outbreak in Kenya, we were stationed within the emergency operations center, which is basically a large room with several phones, uh, screens that are projecting happenings across the world and within the country, news items and all that, anything relevant to COVID-19. So they have been tuned to different channels just so that we capture any other thing that is coming across. While there are also officers that are stationed somewhere, basically following what we call a rumor log, uh, posts that are being uh, uh, obtained from Twitter, Facebook and all that. So anywhere where there's a rumor that somebody who is suspected to be positive for COVID, um, uh, we were trying to investigate either directly or sending sub county teams to the um, locality to try and investigate the basis for the rumors and trying to respond to it. So as you are aware, initially there, are, there were very few cases. Uh, so it was quite easy. Um, I remember among the first few phone calls that we received in the first two weeks or so, you received phone calls like, my neighbor just traveled from Dubai the other day and I'm seeing that he's coughing, I can hear him coughing at night or something like that. And we suspect he could be having coronavirus. So whenever we receive such a phone call, uh, we'd get the details of the exact residence, then we, uh, mobilize a team that would go to try find out the truth uh, behind that. If the person calling had the contact for the person they were suspecting to be uh, uh, possibly infected, then we would just call the person directly and find out, we'd tell them we have 
got information that they could be having symptoms that are similar to those of uh, the COVID infection. So we just tried to find out if that was true. And if in case it was true that they were having symptoms, then we would send a team to pick them up and take them for swabbing. And uh, the test results would then determine what would happen next. So the same rapid response team would also be the ones to respond to cases that have turned positive. After being tested, um, the people who are tested are allowed to continue their business, but will get their contacts from the form they filled uh, before being swabbed. Then we uh, get the results from the lab. Uh, when you get the results, we'd contact the ones that have turned positive. Then the rapid response teams are the ones that coordinate with the ambulances and uh, the evacuation teams. Then we go and collect, um, or rather evacuate these people from wherever they are at that time. Initially, this was surrounded with a lot of suspicion, a lot of mystery. Like I remember one case that we went to in one of the major shopping malls in Nairobi. Um, a lady had uh, presented herself to, uh, to Bagadi Hospital for testing because she had some symptoms. And uh, she was tested. She was uh, released to go home, but under strict instructions to stay in the house. However, she didn't do exactly that. The following day, she went to her workplace, which was in a salon, a busy salon in a major shopping mall. So when her test results came out positive, we called her and she said the truth that she was within, she was at work. Um, so at that point, we usually engage the security operators. They help us to find out exactly where these people are because there are cases whereby we call somebody and they lie about their uh, location. Sometimes they even switch off their phones and things like that. So we are sometimes uh, forced to involve the security operators to confirm exactly where they are, then we go and pick them. So in this particular incident, we went to the mall and uh, people were scared to see all these people in gowns and we went straight to the person. Luckily, she knew we were coming for her, so she separated herself. And the good thing that she did was that she had tried to not to attend to any client by that time, from what we had from her manager and herself. And she had been wearing a mask. By then, it was not mandatory to wear a mask. So that when she had a piece tried, but the mistake was going to work in the first place because of the issue of uh, surfaces and all that. So that, that is what uh, rapid response was initially about. But with the increasing number of cases, it has become more difficult. So currently, the rapid response team are mostly involved in um, responding to requests for mass testing in various places. I believe we recently had um, there are some cases that were reported from some of the ministry, Ministry of Lands. Um, and a few other prominent places. So it's our teams that go to these other to these places whenever there's been a reported case. So, so let's say a worker within a particular uh, work setting uh, testing positive, and uh, there's need to test many people. Then we're the ones who respond to that. Um, so I think that will be enough for now. So um, next. Contact tracing. Um, so contact tracing is mostly involved with uh, trying to find the people that have been in close contact with uh, the cases that have been confirmed positive. Uh, when we were starting this, it was a little bit easier because the cases were few. And uh, initially, people would easily volunteer their cases, I mean, their contacts. But as cases have been increasing, we have with time delegated this to the counties. So each county is doing its own contact tracing and maintaining their own contact lists. Um, among the variables that we are gathering during contact tracing will include things like the name of the case that the person was in contact with and their case ID, that is case number. Um, the name of the particular contact, age, sex, county, sub-county, ward, 
um, landmark, exactly where they are staying, village and all that, that we try to capture if they are health workers or not, because among the uh, people at most risk of this have been health workers. Usually they, we've had so many health workers being listed as contacts because they attended to somebody who later on tested positive. Um, then we also try to find out their relation to the case. Uh, is it a friend, a workmate, a household relative, or something like that? Then the date of last contact with the case. So it is this date of last contact with the case that we use to calculate the number of days that the person has spent since they were last in contact with this person. So we, for this, it is needless to get somebody or list somebody as a contact if they were last in close contact with a particular case more than 30 days ago, for example. Usually more than 14 days, you find if they have not displayed any symptom and with the current situation whereby the infection is out there so much, we're not be too keen on getting them. But if they were in contact with that person within the last 14 days, then we'd be keen on uh, getting them and having them tested and followed up just to check if they develop the infection or any symptoms. So the, for the contact tracing, it's an activity that we do for 14 days for every contact. After that, we advise them to just be on the lookout for any symptoms and uh, report to us if they develop any symptoms after the 14 days from the date of the last contact with the case. Um, after doing contact tracing for um, all the contacts that we have, after calling all of them, uh, finding out if they have any symptoms, um, and if they have symptoms, we specify which ones. At the end of the day, we summarize uh, all that information. And it is part of these summaries that are normally announced by the CS. I believe those who have been following uh, the announcements keenly. At some point, you will hear today this number of contacts um, were followed up. Uh, yes, uh, something like that. So these are things that we do. Uh, we find the total number of contacts that have been listed, then the total number of contacts that we have reached through phone calls. The situations are by some people don't pick their phone calls and things like that. So, um, and from these same contacts, we can generate alerts. Like if somebody has been listed as a contact, then when you call them, you can hear them coughing or they are having difficulty breathing or they report to you they are having a particular symptom. Then we classify it as an alert and we notify the rapid response team to take it up and follow up. So these are the kind of people that we'd want to test immediately, if possible, to find out um, if they've already been infected. Initially, we'd test all contacts. We'd arrange to test all of them. Uh, but uh, currently, with all the crazy numbers, um, it's been quite a challenge. But we encourage all of them to seek testing. Then. Uh, at the end of the day, we send the summaries, which are form part of the daily briefs. Um, so next. Uh, data management. Uh, this uh, is mostly done within the uh, emergency operations center, the offices, where we have a team that sits there to gather the data. Initially, they, it was not a very difficult thing because the cases were few and the contacts were also few. But currently, it has been uh, devolved. The service has been devolved to the counties. So the counties are doing their bit of data management. Then ours is to aggregate the data that we receive from the counties to form uh, the reports. So we do the data management mostly through uh, Excel sheets and Google sheets whenever possible. Uh, Google Sheets are easier to, to manipulate uh, real time and update. Um, so what we receive from the counties are summaries for uh, the people they followed up, the contacts they followed up. Then we aggregate that and come up with some information. We also do data management for the cases. Like what we are currently uh, focusing on a lot is line listing. We get information from the lab 
uh, various labs that are doing the tests. They give us the positive cases. Then we contract these cases, try to get uh, as much information from them as possible. Um, those are the various variables that are being followed up. Things like age, sex, phone number, residence, where, if at all, they've traveled recently, uh, where they traveled from, so that we establish whether it's a, a local transmission or it's an imported case. Although that was um, more common in the earlier stages when we were still having flights coming in. Then we find out if they have recently visited a health facility and which one they've visited so that we can try and elicit contacts from there as well. Then we find out where they are. Are they in hospital or they're at home? And that would help to know whether we need to evacuate them, take them to, uh, for isolation. Or if they're already in hospital, we know how to do follow-up. Now, currently, there are guidelines for uh, uh, isolation at home. So that changes things a little bit. But still, these people are followed up on a daily basis just to uh, make sure they are still OK and they still receive any necessary help. Yes, so we are using Google Sheets and Excel, but we are slowly shifting to EMR, um, electronic uh, medical records, which should be better, should be easier to use for managing the data and for generating reports. So the summaries we we'll get from the counties, uh, we summarize them and send information to the CS. Um, we also use them to prepare daily situational reports, CTREPs, and we do some data analysis. So some of the things you hear the CS are, are announcing, there are a lot of analysis that we do in the background. A lot of it is not really out in the public domain. There's so much that is going on with the data analysis and the whole aspect of data management. But I'll, I'll give you a hint towards the end of the presentation on the kind of crazy data that exists on COVID-19 that people may not be so much aware of. So next. So like I mentioned earlier, we also uh, do capacity building. Um, what you are seeing now is an activity we held in Mombasa County. Um, the first photo was a capacity building on um, a rapid response to the, um, that was the county team that was engaged in uh, response activities. The second photo uh, was capacity building of sub-county teams. That was Likoni sub-county. Um, a few officers from the sub-county and uh, some from a few of the facilities. So we basically do capacity building on the various aspects of COVID-19 response. And like I mentioned, we've done it in a number of counties. Um, uh, next. And yes, we also engage the uh, county health management teams on um, various aspects. Uh, the photo you're seeing there is for one of the counties that will allow me not to mention now. But in this particular county, um, it was among the first counties that we supported uh, with the aim of ensuring that they reach a consensus on establishing a proper, efficient incident command system so that they could respond to the cases effectively and uh, make sure everything was running in a bit an organized way. Uh, initially, they were having challenges uh, because there were like two centers of power. Uh, it's a county that had, uh, they, they have um, a director and a chief officer for public health, and a director and chief officer for um, medical services. So at some point there was a pull and push between the two uh, as to who should really be engaged with the response to COVID-19. And uh, the medical services side felt like they are handling the isolation facilities. So they had the right to be involved in this because they're the ones managing the patients. 
the public health side trade, like the ones doing the surveillance and all the, the other activities, apart from um, case management, so they need to be involved. And there seem to be no agreement on who is in charge and all that. So we went through a whole process of uh, building consensus. And after that, things started moving uh, uh, smoothly. And also getting information data from the sub counties to flow well to the county as well as getting data from the labs to flow uh, faster to the sub county team so that they could respond faster was also achieved at that particular point um, next so um like you've heard from my presentation, there seems to be no place where I'm specifically talking about drugs and what uh, pharmacies are really good at. Um, I've been involved in all those aspects without anybody caring whether I'm a pharmacist or not, uh, because we believe uh, public health matters, as long as you have some little training, you can participate in anything. And it's my belief that pharmacies are well trained in a lot of aspects of our healthcare system that would allow you to fit in so many places. So some of the opportunities that we can pursue in this and any other future outbreaks would include things like leadership, um, management for various levels. Um, I would encourage more pharmacists to apply for the field epidemiology and laboratory training program. Uh, starting from the basic level and even the master's level. Um, I'm told the advert for the master's should be out. I'm not sure if it's really out, but it could be out anytime in the course of this month. You could visit the website and see, and I believe they also do uh, an advert in the papers. It's an interesting program, um, which has always been thought to be a reserve for medical officers and public health officers, but you realize that um, if you are interested in public health and epidemiology in particular, it's a very good area that uh, has not been explored well by pharmacists. And, and that's why you find that uh, pharmacists not, uh, seem not to be appearing in so many places. Even in the incident command structure, you find one pharmacist, yet there's so much that we could do uh, in addition to our usual roles that uh, revolve around uh, medicine. Um, clinical pharmacies can play a very big role in case management. We've had many presentations from different uh, counties, uh, some of them really great, people are doing great stuff, and not just clinical pharmacists, even uh, uh, pharmacists uh, with a bachelor's degree, still doing great stuff in terms of uh, responding to COVID-19. We've had presentations from Kisumu, um, Kilifi, and a few other counties. And yeah, there's, there's so much that pharmacists could do. Uh, logistics and commodity management, let me not say so much about that because that is something that we are very familiar with. But uh, I'd like to emphasize this part of research. Um, and pharmacopidemiologists are also very well trained in this. There's so much data that exists, uh, exists out there that we need to take advantage of, that we need to analyze and make sense of. There is so much that is happening. Uh, there are many cases right now in many counties. How about we get as much information as possible um, as pharmacists, not just microbiologists, but all pharmacists who are well trained and equipped to get so much information that we can use to inform decision making. Right now, we have all seen what has been happening gradually. We've sort of been fumbling around because nobody really understands um, what COVID really is and the real impact and how to manage it and all that. But with time, we are getting a grip of it. So let's do more research to learn more and to inform decision making. Uh, next. I believe that could be the almost the end of the presentation. Um, as part of the uh, response team at the national level, we get swabbed. Uh, on a weekly basis, it's not a very comfortable procedure. A bit uncomfortable for some five minutes or so, but it's okay. Now, uh, next, I think that could be the end, but I have a few highlights that I'd like to bring to your attention that could not be in the slides. 
um, and I like to focus on on uh, mortalities. But before that, let me uh, first of all mention a few uh, famous cases that we've heard about, just to let you know that this thing is real. My intention is that by the end of this CME, we should be able to answer questions like, are the numbers being announced by the CS real, or are they things that are cooked? We've heard of stories of uh, people claiming that those numbers are just cooked by the government to inflate figures and all that. Uh, we should also be able to answer a question like, um, what are the key highlights of this pandemic in Kenya and what are the opportunities for pharmacists? Are there limits to what uh, pharmacists can do in responding to an outbreak? And uh, what is the role of a field epidemiologist in all this? And is this something that is worth pursuing as a pharmacist? So let me highlight a few um, highlights. Uh, we are aware about the first case uh, that we reported as a country. It was famous. Um, it was a public domain uh, from Kajiado County. And uh, the contact, which later turned out to be a case. Um, we are aware about the first death that occurred. That was case number 17, um, an individual from Nairobi County. Uh, the first teenager to um, test positive for COVID was case number 46. That was a 15-year-old male from Nairobi. The first child was a three-year-old male from Kilifi. That was case number 56. The most famous case that uh, people have talked about for a very long time, you've heard about a certain politician. Let me not go into the details. Um, and uh, let me not go into the politics of whether they were indeed positive or not. That's a matter in court. And uh, the first pediatric death was case number 102, a six-year-old male from Nairobi. And um, we've tried to analyze some of the data. One of the cases that we found most interesting was case number 14 was uh, an individual aged over 50 years. And they ended up having so many contacts, primary and secondary contacts that uh, led to so many consequences. Um, the most prominent one being uh, they have one of the major contacts was case number 40, an individual that later turned positive and was listed case number 40. Case number 40 had seven primary contacts, one of whom died. And these seven contacts had four other contacts, one of whom uh, was tested positive in a county that is approximately 900 kilometers from where case 40 was. So one case started positive on one end of the country, the other one is tested positive on the other end of the country, and they're just, they're just one person in between them. So one person can lead to so many other infections. And um, the other funny thing we've noticed is the issue of mortalities. And let me just highlight it within the next, I believe I have about seven minutes left. Mortalities, and uh, some of this data has not been published. It has not been uh, released officially, but it's an analysis that we've done and I can share some of it. Now, majority of the deaths that have occurred have been mostly males who are aged over 65 years, majority. Three quarters of those who have died so far have been having underlying illnesses. And uh, hypertension and diabetes have been the most common among the cases that have died so far. Hypertension and diabetes are most common. There are a few that have had cancer and a few other chronic illnesses, but hypertension and diabetes are almost always there in most of the cases. And the most common presenting feature um, is difficulty breathing. More than half of the people that have died so far have presented with difficulty in breathing at one point or the other. And it's funny that only 15% of those who have died had fever at some point. So that might make us want to ask ourselves, um, 
the screening that we are doing with the thermometers all over the place is it really effective or not because even from my analysis even the ones that are, have not died um the ones that are presenting with fever are probably in the range of five percent of all positive cases so is temperature really sensitive enough for screening that's something that we can debate over another time uh, about lab findings for the ones that have died so far we've had neutrophilia um, lymphocytopenia elevated uh, crp levels and uh, elevated creatinine so elevated crp levels indicating there is inflammation uh, elevated creatinine indicating that uh, there is some kidney damage and elevated creatinine has been common in about half of all the mortalities then about a third of the people who have died have undergone a CT scan and they were all showing ground grass opacities so there's something that really happens in the lungs some serious damage that happened in the lung of those that have ended up uh, succumbing to the disease then uh, the other thing that we've seen from the files that, and this is of interest to pharmacists, is that about three quarters of the cases we ended up dying have been on IV antibiotics. Uh, they were showing some signs of infection, sometimes not so clear what kind of infection, but a lot of times they seem to be having bacterial infection as well. And uh, half of the cases that have died so far have been on mechanical ventilation. And uh, the common uh, final complication that we are seeing in about half of the uh, cases that have died is uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So they develop uh, respiratory distress towards the end, and about half of them, and uh, that comes as the final complication. Then, um, in the interest of time, uh, maybe just the last thing that I'll mention that it's we are seeing that uh, the median hospital stay for the cases that have died so far has been just two days. Two days median hospital stay. It means most of them are coming and dying. Actually, it's a range of from zero to five days. Some are dying while they're just still being admitted, but the median is just two days within the hospital and they already died. So, Tells you that when these people start going down, they go down very fast. And that's something that has been spoken about by other speakers as well. So allow me to stop at that point. I believe we can discuss more under a question and answer session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Biambo. Very, very insightful and informative presentation. So uh, shortly we will go to the Q and A session, but before we do that, we have to recognize that as pharmacists, we are frontline healthcare workers, and we are in danger of contacting COVID, contracting COVID-19. And therefore, I would like to give us a few pointers on how we can protect ourselves in the workplace. I'll take about five minutes and then we can go to q and I thought this is important because now we are starting to lose healthcare workers and as pharmacists, we should do the best to protect ourselves. So the first thing you should be doing in your pharmacy is frequently wash your hands. Once you attend to one patient, please wash your hands before you go to the next. Um, you and the patients and other staff members should observe cough or sneezing etiquette. Just the other day, I saw someone removing their mask before they sneezed into the air. So it's important that you observe coughing and sneezing um, etiquette. If you have someone presenting in your pharmacy with fever and cough, avoid close contact. And if you yourself are presenting with um, any of such symptoms, please 
report and get tested. Make sure people with symptoms are self-isolated. And then just a, a little bit more on hand hygiene. It's one of the most important measures that can prevent COVID-19 infection. Um, if your hands are visibly dirty, wash with soap and water for 40 to 60 seconds. If not visibly dirty, you can use an alcohol-based hand rub and do that for 20 to 30 seconds. Regular hand hygiene should occur, one, after receiving a prescription, and two, after dispensing. Now, in your pharmacy, you have to make sure that there are functional hand washing facilities with constant running water and soap available. WHO has also recommended 70% ethyl alcohol to disinfect small areas uh, between use. Sodium hypochlorite can also be used for disinfecting surfaces and chlorinated water as well. But you should know that with these um, chemicals, you might have dermatitis. So it's important to uh, check if you have a history of contact dermatitis. Um, for pharmacy managers, develop emergency plans and workflow so that you don't have all your staff at the same time in the pharmacy. You can have shifts. Make sure all your staff are trained about COVID-19 prevention and management, and always assess the health status of pharmacists and other pharmacy staff, because you're frontline workers and you get in contact with patients who could possibly be um, infected. Protect your pharmacy personnel, and also strengthen pharmacies' infection monitoring. Ensure you have adequate cleaning and disinfection management, and also strengthen patient management and education. Um, strengthen infection exposure management, and also medical waste management, as well as disposal of masks. Uh, on use of masks, just note that wearing a mask only might not be sufficient to provide adequate um, protection. So other hygiene measures should be adopted. And the WHO actually recommends that you wear a mask when entering a, a room where patients are suspected or confirmed uh, with uh, COVID-19. Use an N95 or equivalent, and N95 will be possibly in hospital settings. In community pharmacies, you can use a surgical mask. How do you don and dock and dispose a mask? First of all, perform hand hygiene before touching the mask. Inspect the mask if it has any tears or holes before putting it on. And then orient which side is the top side, generally where the metal strip is or where the edge is stiff. Ensure the proper side of the mask. Um, usually the colored side should face outward and the whitish white side should be inside. Place the mask on your face. At the top of your nose, you pinch the metal strip so that it fits perfectly and ensure masks cover your mouth and your chin. I've actually walked into pharmacies where you see a pharmacy attendant having a mask on their chin and yet they're attending to patients, which um, actually puts them and their patients at risk. After use, you take off the mask, remove the elastic loops from behind the ears and avoid uh, touching um, the top of the mask, the front of the mask, and also avoid touching potentially contaminated surfaces of the mask. The mask should be discarded in a closed bin immediately after use, and after removing your mask, you perform hand hygiene. Cleaning and disinfection um, can be done using ultraviolet radiation or heat of 56 degrees for 30 minutes. You can use ether, 75% ethanol, 
chlorine containing disinfectant or even chloroform. How do you clean the pharmacy? Make sure that there's regular cleaning and extra attention should be paid to areas where uh, areas that are constantly touched, for example, the doors, the countertops, and even pens that you use to write. Um, the other thing you can uh, reach out to cleaning companies, which can do that better than your staff. So regularly dispose um, paper cloths or mop heads when possible. Clean and disinfect all hard surfaces, floors, chairs, and door handles. I regularly wipe the high touch areas like light switches, refrigerator doors, sink handles, soap dispensers, etc. Ensure that you have adequate waste management so that you must have enough bins. And also, um, staff training is also important. Train them on the disease itself, the technical and scientific information, all your staff should have it. Train them on preventive measures, including use of disinfectants and proper hand hygiene. Train them on how to uh, proceed with a suspected case, including strategies that each pharmacy should implement. Always make sure you have some material, educational material in your pharmacy, like brochures that your, or informational websites where your staff and your patients can get some information. Um, you can vary your opening and closing hours and also rotate staff so that you don't have one person working for long hours a day. Also prepare a notice to your clients telling them to disinfect their hands or wash their hands when entering the pharmacy. Make sure you keep a safe distance of one to two meters between the patients, the customers or other pharmacy staff. Uh, this can be done effectively with floor ma markings. Observe cough etiquette and also avoid shaking hands while in the pharmacy. And then have the prescriptions you need to be filled that are ready. In the public area, make sure um, access to products for sales selection by customers should be restricted. Uh, where you have areas, uh, pharmacies which have um, less, which have shelves where patients can pick up their stuff, that should be locked up and uh, so that you avoid patients touching a lot of stuff. And that should be accessed only by a pharmacy personnel. When you're at the counter, allocate one employee per station or at the counter and avoid swapping. Only essential objects should be at the counter. Wipe and disinfect the counter after each customer. Have an alcohol-based solution to, to disinfect your hands after attending to each patient or customer. About social distancing, Limit the number of patients at the pharmacy at one time. Keep a distance of about one meter when attending to a patient. A tray may be used to collect prescriptions and hand over medicines and process any payment to, uh, so that you can be able to keep that distance. Advise patients to keep a distance of at least one meter between them while waiting. You can use markings with let's say masking tape on the floor where they can stand. Uh, place physical barriers on the doorway of the pharmacy to prevent patients from getting too close. You can cordon off areas um, using store shelving to redirect patients. You can also use plexiglass barriers at the front of the counter to protect yourself. Avoid um, having too many people inside the pharmacy. If possible, some could wait outside the pharmacy. Um, I've, I've, uh, again, advise patients to avoid long stays in the pharmacy, so you should process them fast so that they are able to leave. Um, if possible, you can um, use telepharmacy. Um, again, advise your staff 
and your customers to avoid things like bracelets, watches, rings, and other accessories which can form uh, areas where the virus can um, attach. So those are just some of the pointers. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of other information available, but the emerging thing is home care for COVID-19 patients. And I want you guys to think about strategies which you can utilize to see how pharmacy and particularly community pharmacy, what is the role they can play in home care of COVID-19 patients. So I'll stop there and head to the Q&A sessions. Um, so, uh, Dr. Neto Obala has a question and he's asking, one of the challenges we are currently experiencing is the testing capacity and it raises the index of suspicion. Raising the index of suspicion is a challenge on the ground. What is being done at the lab ministry? So, um, I'm not very sure what that question means, but I think Dr. Uma, you can attempt to answer it. Yes, Doc. Uh, Dr. Neto, so uh, I believe you are asking about the issue of testing capacity. Yes, there's an issue with the testing capacity. The number of uh, test kits is uh, limited. The swabs are also limited in supply. So we are probably not testing enough. In fact, one of the issues that I see people raising a lot on social media is uh, what if this infection is already so widespread in the country and we are just not testing enough. I think that could be true to some extent um, because every day we see a test positivity rate of around 5% or so thereabout, meaning that every time we sample people, every time people present themselves for testing, we are getting about 5% of them turning positive. This is likely to go up with time. So it means we are probably not testing enough. Um, that challenge is related to uh, resources. And unfortunately, that is beyond my um, pay grade, so to speak. But um, there are challenges that we may not do much about at our levels. Uh, what we'd uh, probably recommend is that we try and do targeted testing. We don't just test people uh, blanketly. We try and target the ones that are most risk of infection, especially those that are contacts to known cases, so that we maximize the use of these resources. And I would also think we try and target the ones that are at risk of severe disease, particularly the ones with um, uh, concomitant infections, um, uh, concomitant diseases, you know, rather than just testing every other person because resources will always be limited. So that's what I would say about that. Uh, thank you. And again, on that, an anonymous attendee is asking how often should health workers be tested and alluding to the fact that two pharmacy staff have tested positive in Pumwani. What would you recommend? Well, I don't think there's a guideline specifying how many times a healthcare worker should be tested. Um, again, it, it's a matter of weighing options, in my opinion. Uh, if somebody is a healthcare worker and is known to be having one of the conditions that would put them at a greater risk of having severe disease, then you'd probably want to make sure they're tested a bit more frequently um, than the other. But in my opinion, we don't need to keep testing all the time because the other thing about this test is I could test negative today, but turn positive tomorrow. It's a matter of incubation. The incubation period could be lasting a certain duration. So even those issues of uh, COVID-19 negative certificate uh, we know they have limitations. You could be positive, negative today and positive tomorrow for one reason or the other. So we can't keep testing healthcare workers every day. It's, it doesn't make uh, any sense, even economic. Um, but if somebody has symptoms, I would recommend they get tested. Some develop symptoms that are similar to those for COVID-19. 
So again, maybe not so frequently. I know I mentioned at some point that we get tested on, on an almost weekly basis, usually on Mondays and Tuesdays, but that is mostly focused on the rapid response teams. And whenever we go to the ground to physically locate uh, these cases and when we go to the treatment centers and uh, do the kind of work that we do in terms of um, um, pulling up whatever is happening at the treatment centers and all that, whenever they feel we are highly exposed, that's a point where you might need to get tested. Uh, the rapid response teams, because they are the ones who are carrying out the tests and visiting various places where there are, there's a lot of infections, um, like I remember the time when Isili was uh, in the news for having a lot of new infections. We were sent there for a number of days. So in that kind of a setting, they just wanted to make sure that they capture any positive cases as early as possible to prevent uh, infecting uh, other members of the team because you know that would be so detrimental to the team when so many people are infected at the same time. And I believe you can remember at some point it was in the news that uh, uh, one of the members of the team at uh, the ministry tested positive. It's actually true. It's uh, somebody you are working with. At that time, we were in the uh, contact tracing, the initial stage of the disease when uh, it had not yet even hit Kawangware. In fact, she was, I think, among the first few cases in Kawangware. So when she tested positive, we had to be subjected to the test immediately to determine if somebody had caught it. Then we were sent into quarantine, all of us. So now we were working from quarantine, um, doing the contact tracing and uh, follow up from quarantine. Uh, it was quite an experience, but um, I think it's a matter of weighing the situation. If uh, you feel there's high risk, then you might want to test people, but we cannot say test them every week or every two weeks i mean for how long are we going to be testing people like that because this disease seems not to be going away anytime soon we might have it for several months to come uh, thank you for that response and just to add on that um one of the strategies that you can employ um if you know that a pharmacist or a pharmacist staff um is suffering from comorbid conditions or chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and the like, which put them at high risk of contracting COVID-19, then these are people who should be allocated other duties and not be put at the front line on the counter or given direct patient responsibilities. And that could probably help with the frequency of, reduced frequency of, trace of testing. Uh, there's another question here by Solomon Karanja. And he asks, what tests are done on swabs to ensure safety before use? Are they sterile? And who does those kind of tests? Uh, yes, Solomon, on that, um, this is a matter of quality control. So it's a process that is done by the lab team. Uh, when the uh, swabs are imported, they, like any other uh, commodities that are used in in, in, uh, in the lab, they undergo quality control steps. So we all know they have all the process of quality assurance from the manufacturer's point to the point before um, importation, when they land, there are various uh, uh, quality control uh, steps that are taken through and all that. And the quality control is uh, ongoing. I'm aware the lab team do some sampling of the swabs just to check they are okay. So that is something that is ongoing. Uh, yeah, quality control for lab, it's, it's a, a major thing. So we are pretty confident they are doing a good job in that. Uh, great. There are several questions that are coming in regarding home-based care. Um, what is your role? What is Beltip's role in home-based care? Are you following up patients who are discharged for home-based care? Okay, and um, home-based care, which we are currently recommending, especially for people who are not symptomatic, um, the follow-up is done by the county teams. So I saw somebody was asking about uh, if the FELTEP team is involved in that. Uh, as FELTEP, we are limited in staffing. 
So we may not be able to do all that. So some of these roles were delegated to the counties. So we expect the counties to be doing a follow-up for all cases who are on home-based care. And they also collaborate with the uh, health facilities that are serving as isolation centers so that they get summaries from the health facilities. Then they aggregate the data together, uh, together with the ones they get from a follow-up of the uh, patients on home-based care to give us summaries. So we believe the counties are up to task. Okay. Um, Gusharanjit is asking, we are getting information on an exposure notification app platform to assist individuals in contact tracing initiative. Is this tool proven, I guess, to be effective? Yes, it's been in the news that uh, at some point uh, some application was installed in our phones. Uh, it's actually true. There is something that uh, is there in most, uh, I think, all smartphones. If you go to the settings somewhere, you'll uh, come across it. Now, the, the tool is good, but it is so much dependent on uh, truthfulness from the phone user. Like if I am tested positive today, I need to go there and update that I've tested positive so that those whose uh, Bluetooth devices, like right now uh, for Android phones, it depends so much on Bluetooth. If my Bluetooth device is turned on and uh, your Bluetooth device is turned on and we come close to each other, then the, your phone can alert you that you are close to somebody who recently tested positive for uh, coronavirus. So it depends so much on the truthfulness and the knowledge of the person who owns the phone. So I'm sure most of us have not even realized that it depends on Bluetooth and need to activate something. And those who are testing positive are not going there to update their status. So it, it's so much more of a, a personal initiative than something that would blanketly tell the truth because your phone has no way of uh, knowing that you are COVID positive if you don't update it somewhere. Unless we are suggesting that the government should uh, update these, uh, I mean, there are, there are limitations, there are limits to uh, privacy matters and all that. So it's more of a personal initiative. If all of us can be proactive, then it would work very well. But as of now, I'm not so sure it's doing the job. Thank you. And Dr. Peter Ongwai is asking, what is the difference between contact tracing and contact tracking? Um, I would say in our case, uh, we consider that more of semantics. We are using the term contact tracing to, as a broad term to include everything that involves uh, following up of the contacts. Um, Tracking sounds more like follow-up and tracing sounds more like identifying and finding where they are. But for my case, we are using this loosely to refer to all matters relating to contacts where we are doing the actual tracing, knowing where they are and uh, follow up to check on them if they develop any symptoms or if there's any other issue. So. It's more of uh, semantics for now, but we are using it uh, broadly. But yeah, tracking sounds like uh, it's more appropriate in English. Mm -hmm. David Taranja asks, you raised a pertinent issue as regards fever, and this coupled with WHO now stating that COVID-19 is airborne, are we taking the right preventative measures? Okay, um, we have not received official communication from the ministry uh, confirming that uh, indeed this thing is now airborne. We all know there's been a lot of back and forth concerning this issue at WHO and there, there's a lot of politics uh, revolving around WHO. Well, um, if at all this is airborne by any chance, then one of the uh, 
important measures that we should never neglect is wearing of masks. It would then be so important because wherever you are, you don't know whether the air there is contaminated or not. And the chances that it could be contaminated if you are in an area that already has reported cases. So masks would be important. I don't know what we do about eyes, where we'll be walking around with the face shields everywhere in addition to the mask to protect our eyes. Um, it will become so tough if this is proven to be airborne. It will be a little bit tougher, but right now I think masks is something we should definitely focus on. And um, yeah, uh, the issue of fever, fever, few people are presenting with fever, very few, probably around 5% currently. Um, actually, slightly less than 5% of our cases currently. And uh, among the people who have died, like I mentioned earlier, very few are presenting with fever. So it's around 15% that have died that had fever at some point. So temperature check, well, it's good. It will might help to capture some. Uh, the question is uh, how effective because some of the fevers we are getting are ending up to be malaria, other causes of fever. At one point when I was going to work, I was stopped at the gate and uh, my temperature was taken. It was found to be 38.9. And the soldiers froze. So I told them, repeat. When they repeated, it was 37.9. So they were convinced that I had fever. It was early in the morning and it was a very cold day, so my AC was turned on. They didn't realize that the temperature they were getting was just from the AC. So when I stepped out of the car, I, they took the third one, then they found it was uh, 37.1 and they were confused. So temperature is really a funny thing. It depends on the skill of the person that is doing it, but I don't think it's that effective. Okay, that's a point to not uh, there. With what we are currently doing all over the place, it might not be very effective. Uh, Kathleen Wambura asks, what is the average percentage of DKS patients seen, of DKS seen in patients who have succumbed to COVID-19? Um, I Sorry, Catherine, I don't have that information uh, on the percentage of people with uh, diabetic acidosis. Maybe something I should uh, dig up further, but the little analysis we've done, the data that I can access, although right now I'm not so sure I can open it in good time, is the uh, diabetic cases in general. Yeah. But what we are seeing is that uh, among those that had diabetes by the time of their death, uh, the sugars were found to be pretty high in quite a number of them. Um, but I may not have the figures right now. Uh, maybe in another session, I would uh, make a comment on that. Uh, I was just uh, actually reading a Medscape article earlier this morning, and they were saying just hyperglycemia in itself will be a risk factor for mortality in COVID-19, regardless of whether somebody has been diagnosed with type 2 B or not. So that's just something to think about. Um, Faith is concerned that she works in a hospital where um, they are not paperless, so they keep handling patient files from wards. And so how have other colleagues been able to go paperless um, in a situation where there's no electronic medical record. I'm not sure who can address that question. But I guess the thing is just to have your hospital um, try and invest in, uh, in pharmacy and have some policies where you say, well, we need to be protected from this, so we need some electronic medical records. Um, I think that will be beyond the scope of this discussion. Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, somebody else was asking whether there's any evidence of infection from inanimate objects like clothes, surfaces, etc. I think it's related uh, to Faith's concern. Do you have any comment, Doc? 
Yes, um, there have been a few studies that have proven that uh, some people got infected from inanimate objects. We have had a few cases. There's one I talked to about a month ago. Um, and this is somebody who had been observing, a healthcare worker actually, had been observing uh, all the measures that are necessary. Uh, I'm saying they are healthcare workers, but from their description, it the level of exposure was not so much. They were not attending to COVID patients in the wards. They are not really handling um, uh, materials that could have been contaminated from the wards. But it was quite clear that uh, they had taken adequate measures, but still ended up with infection. Another case was uh, somebody who, I can't remember the exact profession, but they were claiming that the only time they left the house was for shopping in a supermarket over the uh, past one month or so. And they were really wondering how they ended up being positive. Where did they get it from? It's somebody who stays alone and uh, does a lot of online shopping. So they're wondering where the infection really came from. So we were really trying to figure out how, how they ended up getting infected if they were really wearing masks as they're claiming. And they're, uh, it's somebody with uh, OCD and, uh, and uh, somebody who's really keen on hygiene. I, I believe those that have OCD and are keen on hygiene know what I'm talking about. They do their best, but somehow they end up with the infection. So the question is how? And uh, it, we tended to believe that it could have been from surfaces. One of the other interesting things that I noticed um, when a number of cases were reported from um, industrial area remand prison, uh, I was sent there with together the, uh, somebody from WHO and a team from the prisons department to investigate what had really happened because there were two initial cases then uh, about three weeks break without any case. Then suddenly there were uh, 31 new cases in the same prison. So people were wondering how did this happen exactly? And from my investigation, it, it seemed like uh, the infection could have been spread by one of the staff. We are suspecting one of the staff. Let me not go into space because this is a sensitive uh, area. But we suspect that one of the staff that served the positive cases before they were tested positive could have handled these items, the trays and the plates and all that. Then they got contaminated, then uh, incubated for a period, then ended up infecting new uh, inmates through the same objects they were handling because there's no point they were greeting or coming into close contact when we gauged from these, there were remandies and there were, their movement was very much contained. So there are many uh, indicators, the fact that uh, infection through inanimate objects is very possible, very likely. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fred Odiambo for a very insightful presentation. Thank you uh, participants for your questions and answer and your discussions. I'd like to put that to a close, but before I do, um, the PSK president, Dr. Louis Machogu, has something to tell the members. Buena president, Karibu. Hello, guys. Hello. 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 Oh, you can hear me. All right. All right. Uh, so I had a quick presentation to make, uh, just three slides. Um, allow me to share, is someone allowing me to share? Oh, there you go, I'm able to share right now. Um, to the participants and uh, Dr. Odiambo, to the, to the facilitators, uh, Dr. Mungomba and Dr. Sylvia, thank you. You guys are doing a good job week on week. Uh, Sante sana. 
Um, for me, it's just uh, I've been hearing, um, we've been equipping ourselves on the su- supporting our patients, of course, during these hard times. That's very good. Um, uh, I'm personally concerned, and the epidemiologist might need to do a study on this. Um, as pharmacists, we've lost uh, three pharmacists the last maybe two months. And uh, this is uh, a little bit worrying for me. Um, I'm a bit concerned. And uh, I'm just from just no, no research done on this or any other matter, it's just, uh, just looking at, at, at the numbers, it's worrying for me. Um, but so I would like to ask ourselves, how are we taking care of, of ourselves? What's, what's, what, wellness, what wellness activities are we doing? Um, we've seen that there's increased risk of NCDs due to the unintended sanitary lifestyles. We are working even longer. Those of us who work in front of computers, we are, a lot of is even demanded of us. There's increased stress levels due to the changes. Of course, diet is poor. Uh, this is also compounded by no checkups, self-management of pains. People are just doing their own things at home, managing their own pain. And here I'm talking about uh, healthcare workers. So, so I know the ministry and, uh, and uh, some of our associations have done the wellness sort of uh, calls. This mostly is for psychosocial support. Um, uh, but I'm also concerned about these, uh, these uh, recommendations. Like, I mean, if it's our patients, we usually tell them to go for full body checkup. And you know the different tests that they can do, kidney function, liver function, lipid profile, uh, blood pressure, cardiac enzymes, blood sugar related. So both your blood sugar test and maybe the HAB1C uh, screening. Uh, we recommend that uh, 35 to 50 year olds do it two times a year. Um, above 50 years, you do it four times a year. Uh, but the question is, are we exempt from this good advice? Yeah. So we need to think about that. Uh, this is the wellness, illness wellness continuum uh, by Travis. Um, we mostly focus, um, most of us are in the neutral points, you know, at the point where we don't have any illness. Yeah. Uh, you hear if, uh, I mean, all the three cases that happened, no one said that these people were living of, with illnesses or anything like that. And I'm not trying to extrapolate that it might mean that uh, something is happening, but I'm saying we need to be concerned. Yeah. And uh, I, w- I would like for us to move to the, you know, wellness uh, paradigm, you know, where we are aware, educated and do something about, you know, uh, make targets for ourselves. If it's uh, walking, if it's uh, renewing ourselves, uh, taking breaks and things like that, because mostly we are waiting for signs, symptoms and disability. And the, sometimes it can be such a slippery slope. You are moving immediately from the neutral point to premature death. Yeah. Um, and I think this slide maybe better explains it. Uh, most of us are in the neutral point. Um, that's in the comfort zone. You know, we are inconsistent. We have inconsistent nutrition and exercise. Our health is not a priority. We don't have any symptoms. Yeah. Then the next thing you hear is uh, premature death. Yeah. So how it, um, of course, there are issues there in between of poor health, maybe pre-existing the, um, pre-existing conditions and things like that. And that's what Dr. Sylvia was saying. Uh, maybe such colleagues can be exempted from the uh, direct contacts, yeah, and do other, other tasks that uh, help the team move forward. Um, of course, the last one there is a disease where there's poor quality of life and uh, the fruits of poor quality of life and multiple medications. Uh, on this other spectrum is uh, moving towards being aware and moving towards good health. Uh, that's a good diet, regular exercise, education, educating ourselves on wellness, and moving to a holistic uh, lifestyle and active engagement. Um, yeah, and uh, I think here yeah, the, the catchphrase is the holistic lifestyle, which then is explained by this. So holistic lifestyle is physical, social, emotional support, spiritual, and mental. Um, where we and my question is, as pharmacists, as healthcare workers, do we, do we belong to a cause or a community? Uh, in PSK right now, all branches are devolved. We have 40% funds that are devolved. We, are, we have uh, capacity to do activities. They are looking for opportunities to serve. 
yeah that make us active in our communities or even just uh, uh cuz the wellness is beyond just physical wellness the social mental and spiritual so are we plugged in to as pharmacists or as healthcare workers are we in the rotary clubs are we in the faith based areas uh, um are we focusing on mentoring others and how how are we uh, applying ourselves to get this sort of holistic approach uh, to get ourselves because also wellness is not just the issue of lack of an illness yeah it's uh, it's that complete and ho- holistic point of view and for me it's just uh, to remind us um, also to do uh, some full body checkups so that we um, at least know where we are and you know once you know where you are you can be assisted yeah uh, I think that's it, uh, Sylvia. Thank you so much, our president, for reminding us to take care of ourselves. Because a lot of times we are so uh, involved in taking care of others, we forget ourselves. So let us all support yeah. each other. Let us all help each other out. We can beat this together. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Daniela to close the session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Opanga, for such excellent moderation. <clears throat> I would also wish to thank our speakers uh, today, our main speaker, Dr. Frederick Homer. Your presentation was very informative. And, um, you know, it's, uh, this is an area that has, that has been unexploited by pharmacists. And thank you for challenging us uh, to get into that area because we have a lot to offer. And certainly from what you have, the activities you have been doing in the EOC, in the rapid response teams, we can see that you need more hands. So I hope people take up your challenge to do the FELTEP program or similar. Um, I thank you, Sylvia, for that um, presentation on you know, workplace uh, safety. Um, it, was, it, was very, it was very useful. Uh, people have asked if we can uh, give it to them in form of slides. So maybe we can uh, confer after this and just release a, a slide deck with those very important points on how people can be safer uh, as they practice their, their pharmacy. So thank you very much, Dr. Opanga. And uh, Mr. President, your, your three last slides are so important because um, it has indeed been a very worrying um, trend to lose uh, three pharmacists uh, to sudden death in the last six weeks. And, and sure enough, uh, I'm sure many, many of us fall in the category where we are not bothered about our wellness. And uh, thank you for the challenge to be proactive about our own health because we cannot take care of others before we take care of ourselves. Um, Dr. Mungoma left, but thank you also to him for, for the moderation. Um, thank you participants uh, for staying locked on. We apologize for running a bit uh, over time, but the discussions were very rich. Remember, we shall make uh, this whole uh, webinar available on the Pharma- Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya's YouTube page uh, from tomorrow. And so if you want to catch up on some points, you can uh, uh, c- catch up there, as well as find all our previous COVID-19 dialogues on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, For the KPA members, don't worry about your CPD points. We always send the list of participants to your officials to award you uh, CPD points. For the for PSK members, remember to subscribe on PPB portal if you haven't already, so that we can be able to give you your points. So join us again next uh, Wednesday for another edition of COVID-19 Dialogues. Uh, For now, it's a good day from me. Asante sana.